So there's one. And then the second one's coming. This is the stupidest thing. Oh, this is big bar, right? Yeah, yes. A lot of movies inside. Oh, do we, have, we don't have upper bar reader. This needs upper bar reader. Let me see if we can do it. Yeah, you are great. So which one do you want to open first? Yeah, this one first. Thank you very much. This short part at least. Let me let me shift over to the PC then. Yeah. Oh, there. Hey, can, you, can you control it for me? Make the screen bigger or whatever? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Right, I think we're ready. Um, okay. Um, so now let's let's start with the technical difficulties. I mean, so we're, we're really pleased to have Dr. Reed do Dr. Paul today. Guys, they'll fly down just a bit. Okay, let's get started. Yeah, let's get started, folks. Yeah. Um, we're pleased to have Dr. Chomi Lane, Yang from um, Clarkson University, to brief us on some home CFD um, algorithm type stuff. Um, Dr. Bang got his degree from the University of London, got his PhD there, and he worked as a postdoc from Stanford under Tony Jameson and Iowa State under ZJ Wong. And then he uh, went to George Washington University, which is in DC, and worked there for how many, about five, six years? Uh, nine years. Nine years. And then he went far north into the depths of north of New York, and now he works at Clarkson University. Um, he's a past winner of the NSF's Career Award, which is very prestigious, ONR's Young Investigator Program Award, and also the PK Award, which is also very, very prestigious. So we're very pleased to have him here, and he's doing some really nice, exciting stuff with CFD. So we'll have you guys all here. Well, thank you very much, Jake, for the introduction. Um, so I will split my talk into two parts. So the first part will focus on primarily on complex geometries. Because as an aerospace engineer, we like designs. So the complex geometry is heavily associated with design innovation. And so I will talk about three different applications, and flagging wing, and marine propeller, and also ductile wind turbine. And the second part of my talk will be on magnetohydrodynamics. And mostly over there, I will talk about the method itself, and then how do we, did we do with the, the complexity of those equations for MHD. So here, the team was uh, mostly at uh, the master's level, I would say, rather than PhD level. Uh, Chi Ding uh, graduated last year uh, with a master's degree, and then followed by Drew Safford is going to defend next week for his master's thesis. And then uh, Bing now become a faculty and I'm collaborating with a designer and my colleague, Ken Weiser. He was an employee of Boeing for almost 20 years. And then the W wind turbine that I'm going to show here uh, is the exact model that he designed. And I'm also collaborating with a professor in mathematics department. Okay, so first, without talking about an algorithm, I'm going to tell you that I'm solving fully compressible uh, Navier-Stokes equations. And here I'm showing you a flapping wing simulation, which I was, uh, which I did the simulation when I was a postdoc at Stanford. Uh, so here is a Naka 12 symmetric airfoil, and if you look at the vertex street behind the airfoil, and you see that the street is not symmetric, and clearly you see an upward jet. The airflow is symmetric. The flow goes from left to right. And that's strange. It is strange, right? So what has triggered this asymmetry? Anybody can give a guess? And I, if you think about this is a 
a wing of the hummingbird, you can see that the only thing that we are doing here is flap the wing very fast. And then you generate a huge lift. So if you flap it at a very high frequency, you generate a lift. And this asymmetry depends purely on the first stroke of the flapping. Okay? So if my first stroke goes down, and I generate upward lift. If I, my first stroke goes up, I will get a downward lift. Okay? And what I can say is that actually on my laptop, I prepared a very ugly grid, and which was in our publication. And I, you can see that the flow field is very cleanly resolved. Right? So the basic algorithm uh, is quite robust in terms of dealing with this type of geometry. Okay, the second case that I'm going to demonstrate here is flow around a heaving cylinder <laughs> followed by a flapping airfoil. So this is a three-dimensional simulation and a pretty low Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number is 500 based on cylinder diameter. And we will have transitional flow. And the cylinder is heaving and will generate a pretty coherent uh, vertex streak. And actually there is a synchronization because you have a vertex shading frequency and you also have a flapping, heaving frequency of the cylinder. In that way, you intensify the vertex shading in a way that uh, it carries with a lot of energy. So now I will do a control, an active control of that flapping wing. So this control is done in such a way that it will heave up and down, and meanwhile it will pitch. Okay. So what I will do is that I will ask the airfoil to glide. I will use the word glide because I don't want the airfoil to heat directly onto the vertex from the cylinder. Okay, I will find that small gap in between the blue and red vertices and try to let it glide freely. Okay, I did not, pr I did not print the, the drag coefficient over here for you. I can tell you that that is significantly reduced the drag. Imagine that you, you have two skillful swimmers in a swimming hole. If the first swimmer is very powerful, you can save a lot of energy. You try to glide through the vertices from your front swimmer, and you save a lot of energy. So this is the active control that we did. All right, the second one I will talk, uh, talk primarily is due to uh, the, the financial support from Office of Naval Research, where we want to develop an algorithm that we can do light eddy simulation. I will not go to detail of light eddy simulation here, but uh, what I can say is that we want to model the fluid dynamics, we want to resolve the wall for marine propellers. So propeller has rotating parts, but we don't want to lose accuracy over there. So we will do light eddy simulation and do wall resolved models over there. And so that will create a difficulty geometrically that we need to deal with spinning part and also stationary part. Now we want to couple these two parts without losing any numerical accuracy. So that's what we do, and in 2015, we published this article, which was the first algorithm for compressible flow, where we have high order accuracy for dealing with sliding mesh. And if you use ANSYS Fluent, we know that it's a second order algorithm, and then because you have a circular interface that will be spinning, you will lose numerical accuracy. And then your device will spin all the time, and then you keep accumulating numerical error over there. So obviously, commercial package cannot do this very well, right? So especially for this test problem, this is a Taylor flow. it is an internal flow problem. If you keep generating numerical error for an internal flow, then eventually your flow field will be contaminated. And so what we do is that we will invent a new algorithm that is high order that will not generate any numerical error. So this is exactly what we published in this GSP article. All right, so I'm going to talk about the application of this high order sliding met mesh method to marine propeller and also some validation of the code. 
And here what we do is that we do sliding mesh in 3D and for a simple three-blade propeller. And where we have availability of high fidelity experimental data. And we will do a pretty coarse uh, grid, uh, but no worry about this coarse grid because we have high order method. And we can construct high order analytically within each element and then generate a more a number of degrees of freedom analytically. Okay, so at a low Reynolds number, uh, this is what I'm going to show you. I'm going to use a Q criterion and try to extract the, the coherent flow structures and to visualize that is allow you to see the vertical structures. And how many vertical structures do you see here? So we have laminar flow past the P4119 marine propeller. You see tip vertices, right? Three blades and three series of tip vertices, right? And you also see internally, you see, just behind the hub, you see hub vertex as well. And, but what you can see that this algorithm uh, captures the structure, at least for laminar flow, very cleanly. And what's more is that because we are doing well resolved models, and we can readily plot surface pressure distribution. If you plot surface pressure distribution for a propeller, the designers will be very excited because they care about the pressure distribution on the surface a lot. And this will indicate uh, some useful information for cavitation control as well later on, especially in the marine propeller world. All right, so now how about we do a simulation at design condition? And we need to reach much higher in the number, which is almost a million. So if you can't have the Reynolds number, you obviously need to refine the mass. That's one of the advantages of using our high order method. We don't need to refine the mass. We analytically increase the degree of polynomial. So the mass is still the original cost mass, but here the total number of degrees of freedom is much higher. It's around 40 million degrees of freedom. Okay, what we see is that now, you still see the well-defined tip vertex, right? But how about it in the middle? Look at the hub vertex. Do you see a lot of turbulent flow structures? Right. So this is one of the advantages of using world resolved large eddy simulation. Right? You capture those fine structures as long as your resolution is sufficient. Okay, uh, so I was talking with uh, uh, Professor Ikar that you know, this method is also suitable uh, for predicting acoustics um, because it's high order, it's unstructured. Uh, so what I will show you here is that I'm going to plot thrust coefficient and also torque coefficient against time. And you clearly see that uh, we run the simulation over many evolutions of rotation. And what you should appreciate here is it's stabilized. KT, KQ plus stabilized. Commercial package, many commercial packages will fail. Do you know what? Your method, your algorithm needs to be conservative. If your, your method does not conserve kinetic energy, you cannot preserve your long time period integration. Your solution will vary over time. But uh, we have high order method, we have sliding mesh. It did not contaminate the results. And our conservation property is preserved. That's why we can do large eddy simulation over long time. Okay, so here, since we have experimental data, I'm going to compare a little bit uh, again our LES. A like any simulation against experimental data, uh, you can see uh, in terms of the mean thrust, mean torque, KQ, and also the efficiency, and uh, generally uh, the error is definitely below 5%. And if you use a, a, a modular data, that is, you know, one series of data is published, 
1984. The other series was published in 1989. And if you look at the second series, and the error is within 2.5%. Right. So it's fairly good uh, for this relatively low Reynolds number, relatively simple propeller. We are extremely happy uh, with this method development. Okay, so now since four years ago, I joined Carson University as a full professor, and I, I kind of like, I, I got excited with several uh, applications that my colleague was involved. So with Dr. Kim Wieser, uh, and we immediately looked into this Dr. Wind Turbine. And we also managed to get a grant uh, to uh, co-advise students together. Um, so this is the turbine that he built. And uh, we got a several uh, erected on campus. Uh, and uh, this turbine actually will generate electricity, will power uh, uh, electric bulb uh, quite readily. And on the right is where we generated a mesh to tell you that, okay, so we got a rotor inside, we got a duct outside, okay? All right, uh, so I would, I, will, I will still use a sliding mesh okay, for doing that because I have stationary duct, I'll have a spinning rotor. So using the uh, sliding mesh will be fine. And this is, uh, if you see the, the, the plot on the left, you see outside gray box, the cylindrical box, is the fluid domain, which is fixed. And inside that gray box, do you see that a, 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 a even darker gray small region? That small region will be spinning. Okay. Then what we do using this sliding algorithm is to couple this spinning small region in the middle uh, with outside fixed region. So the Reynolds number, based on typically we define Reynolds number based on the maximum characteristic length. That is the exit diameter of the duct, right? And that Reynolds number gives us uh, around 2.5 mm. Okay, uh, so let me directly jump into. So if you use radius, is 1.25, and then. In the design world of uh, wind turbine, there is a very important parameter called tip three ratio lambda. Okay? Meaning that, uh, well, you have wind speed, then you know, the performance of the turbine depends on how fast you're gonna spin. Right? Um, so let's first look at an open rotor. So the open rotor, the flow physics behind open rotor is similar to a propeller. Right? We have tip vortex, and uh, since we have a hub over there to support the rudder, so it will generate a hub. Uh, but in general, you see that you look at the blue region, and it's very slender. It's confined to <coughs> small volume. Uh, and then the, 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 the turbulent flow structure is mostly dominated by tip vertex over there. So now we place that dot in. And what you see immediately, you see that, okay, the duct changes the tip vertex significantly, right? And meanwhile, if you look at, look into the middle, the low speed region in blue is enlarged significantly. Okay, now you think, you get kinetic energy from the flow, right? So the flow, the wind speed in front of the rotor is very high. Now, after the rotor, it dropped significantly because the wind turbine extracted energy out effectively. Okay? So you want the flow becomes very slow after the rotor. So clearly, the duct enhanced, enhanced the kind of the power uh, to be extracted because you clearly see a much larger region with the duct in. Uh, comparing to that open rotor. Okay. So I can tell you that we immediately see 30% of, you know, around 30% energy gain by using a passive device like a diffuser over here. So ducted wind turbine or ducted marine turbine is a great idea. I know some of the colleagues here at NC State also do ducted design. Um, so what we show you here is that, okay, uh, my student compared the ducted wind turbine efficiency uh, on the left, against the open uh, wind turbine on the right, uh, you can clearly see the energy 
uh, improvement. Um, and also, uh, my career was mostly on large eddy simulation, and uh, we want to do faster simulations and collect the results and interact with designers. So we found that um, you know, LES is very expensive. We can only do a few. Um, so engineering-wise, uh, we want to provide a faster solution. Why not to do some URANs? So this is one URANs solution. Uh, and at uh, optimal tip speed ratio, you clearly see uh, the low speed region, right? From just from the streamline. And because the streamline is colored by the velocity. So you can clearly see, uh, indeed, at optimal tip, rate, tip speed ratio, uh, the weak has a lot of low speed flow. And you can see, uh, if I do a two-dimensional plot of the contour based on velocity, uh, you see low speed region. What from turbulence model do you use? Uh, this is a capsule, two equation model. Capsule, yeah. Um, and I, let's compare uh, Eurans against LES. And I, I mean, Eurans is like a, you know, a couple hours, and Mac is closer. Uh, and the LES is like, okay, a month, oh. <laughs> uh, and two weeks on 2,000 CPUs, maybe something like that. And uh, you can see CP, URANS captures, captures the top coefficient very well. But for thrust, and the difference is about 6%. So, so with the URANS, could you, could you, you don't have a need to resolve the structure. Of the turbulence, could you lower the accuracy of your right. spectral method? Could you like reduce the right? This is that's a, you keep the same accuracy as you would for the LES. Yeah, and unfortunately, this uh, this LES, we need to make sure that uh, the method itself is stable. So without a good resolution, it may suffer so for from. the RANs, could you like reduce the bait order of we, accuracy? We we, we haven't we haven't integrated <laughs> RANs with this high order algorithm. Yet. Oh, okay. So this is this is this URANs was done using standard yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So this, uh, okay. This is at uh, um, a high tip speed ratio. I mean, let's say if that is no longer optimal, you can clearly see that the turbine will not be very efficient anymore. Right? So you, you see here the the low speed region is very narrow. Um, so okay. Um, so we did check a range of lambda tip speed ratio, and we use the computational to pinpoint which lambda is the optimal tip three ratio. And we found that it's 3.93. And Dr. Wieser's design was lambda four. You can see that our prediction verified that, okay, the designer did a great job. Okay, all right. So there is a thrust coefficient, and we plot that against the lambda as well. And there's a famous theory from a Scottish designer is that optimal thrust coefficient should be A over 9. If you look at our prediction and look at the vertical axis, and our prediction is 0.887 or something, right? You can see it's extremely close, 8 over 9 optimal thrust coefficient. So I should say my colleague designed a really good wind turbine. OK, so I will, I will say, um, uh, this is some uh, conclusion uh, overall. And recently we submitted this for a journal article in uh, uh, ASME Journal of Fluids Engineering. Should be a, should be a, should be available now online. Um, so I will stop here, and uh, I will jump to a new, a uh, different topic. So I had a grant from National Science Foundation and really uh, helped me to, um, yeah. So this is a grant from National Science Foundation helped me to, uh, to, to I, will, I won't say it's complete, you know, I helped me build the, you know, the basic part of uh, research. And then I feel that recently I become more ready. Uh, so Two years ago, I submitted a proposal to Air Force that gave me a new grant. So I think now is really a, a good period for my research on magnetohydrodynamics. I think in the next three years, I will uh, be able to con contribute more substantially uh, to the aerospace science uh, aspect uh, using the magne uh, magnetohydrodynamic models. And first of all, uh, very rarely you see people do unstructured mesh simulation for MHD. We are one of the few. 
And uh, and also I can tell you that uh, for the part without involving mag magnetic field, I have completed a model for 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 simulating the sun. Okay, uh, because the the origin of space weather is from the sun. So we want to predict the plasma di dynamics of the sun first. Uh, so I will uh, mostly talk about how to construct a high order algorithm that uh, is stable uh, for simulating MHD on unstructured mesh. Okay? And the algorithm that we created was called spectral difference method uh, with divergence cleaning. Okay? And we are quite excited because uh, just this year we published this algorithm out. Okay, so uh, if you look at the sun, and there's <coughs> one region here uh, in the graph is in red. So that region is called a convection region, or convection zone. It is because at the bottom of the convection zone, the temperature is very high. At the top, because of the radiation, right, sun will radiate heat out. The temperature at the top is very low, relatively. Okay, so the heat transfer, the heat transfer will drive the flow. That's the unique part. <laughs> so the sun, well, has a lot of fluid dynamics, but the fluid dynamics was driven by heat transfer. And at least through the simulation, I discovered that. Okay. So heat transfer is the driver. And then heat transfer, because this stratification of temperature and density, it drives a convection. Okay. Because Basically, the hot fluid is lighter, hot fluid will pop up. And then reaching the top, the fluid will be cooled down, right? After cool, the cooled down, they will become denser, they will sink down, and you form convection loops like that. Okay, so the, the one complication is that the sun is a rotating system. Sun spins, right? Sun spins, very weird. Think about our Earth, a spinning body. It's a spinning rigid body. But the top one-third radius of the sun is gaseous. If you spin a gaseous ball, well, something weird because the convection is happening over there. What, is, what happens is that the equatorial region spins much faster it takes 25 days on Earth to spin one period. The two polar regions take 35 days to spin one period. So there is a 10 day difference in rotation. And this is called the differential rotation. So differential rotation is a first order effect in the sun and if you build a solver for simulating the sun, you have to capture first this first order effect. You have to be able to predict differential rotation. I mean, if you cannot even predict differential rotation, nobody will look at your solver, right? Okay, so what we do here for this part of research, I will develop, first of all, a solver to simulate the hydrodynamics of the sun. And secondly, and we want to deal with magnetohydrodynamics. So we want to predict the 3D solar dynamo. So, You've got a plasma which ionizes gas, and then you spin the ball, it will generate a magnetic field for you. That's called dynamo. Okay? All right, uh, so I want to say that, uh, you know, uh, this is before I received my tenure, and uh, we, we worked very hard on code development, and we did not publish a lot of articles. And uh, we managed to publish two papers, and based on six year effort. And, and the first paper that we report is code that we simulate hydrodynamics of the sun. And this code is called Chorus. Okay? And Dr. Mark Mish was a scientist uh, in NCAR, Colorado. So in those days, I often spent my summer months uh, in Colorado. I visited him because I wanted to learn physics. And, uh, and then the second paper is that after we developed the solver, we used this to predict um, our blade stars. So if you think about the sun, Sun is almost like a perfect sphere. Right? But in the galaxy, there are a lot of stars that are much bigger than the sun. They spin much faster. The result is that they don't have perfect spherical shape anymore. They become like a chicken egg, elliptical, 
right? So because we call it the oblate star. And then the, uh, you know, people want to understand the, the flow physics inside. Right? So this solver, because it is unstructured, and next, so Mark told me that you know, we should look into oblate star, right? And uh, yeah, that's, then we immediately you know, uh, did the match. It's not very difficult. So one more semester, uh, we investigated oblate star and published in this article. Okay, um, so you often you know watch the map for Earth, right? That will do a two-dimensional projection. This projection is called Moway projection. And I, let's say if I look at the sun, I will choose a certain radius. Let's say because I want to look at the interior of the sun, so I will look at a 0.95 radius of the sun. Okay, so you said near the top of the sun, okay? in the middle, but at 0.95 solar radius. And what I will do is that I will plot the vertical flow velocity. So if you see red, it means that the fluid is going up, going outward. If you see blue, the color means that the fluid is sinking down to the center of the, the sun. All right? So clearly, you see that I started from the kind of um, equ equilibrium state where you know convection was not there yet. I just specified the certain boundary conditions, the certain initial condition, and it triggered, it's here now everything is kind of like in a static uh, condition, and then the model will generate the convection for you. Okay? And you see convection happens slowly, and then the rotation kicks in, it will spin the equatorial region much faster. And near two poles will be relatively slow, so we should safely claim that this is the first unstructured grid code uh, that successfully predicted the differential rotation of the sun. Okay. And uh, I'm not a real solar physicist. I, I want this code uh, to be accepted by the community because we don't have a successful unstructured code for the community yet. And so that's, uh, we will continue our collaboration with NCAR, and especially once our MHD capability is ready. Yeah, I think we expect more people will use this software. It will be open source. Okay. So now uh, we want to look into MHD. And uh, looking into MHD is not that trivial. Okay? And first of all, we like high order. Think about it. If you want to mesh the sun, you need to deal with a spherical shell geometry. The complication is that the boundary will be curved. Right? The the domain size is huge for simulating sun. Your mesh resolution definitely will not be enough. If you lose some accuracy in representing the geometry, this is a first order effect. There's no way to get a correct fluid physics anymore. Right? So if you use a low order algorithm, you will suffer. When I was a postdoc at Stanford, I worked on phantom volume for the sun for a semester. Um, so I, I, I noticed this effect, and then after becoming a professor, obviously, I, I, you know, that's the beauty of uh, working as a professor, you have flexibility. So over the summer, I immediately changed uh, you know, the algorithm to high order, and I started to use a kind of, initially we use idea like from the finite element world, we call it isoparametric mapping. Isoparametric mapping is not good enough for a spherical shell surface. So no matter how well you do using isoparametric mapping, you will lose some accuracy. Ideally, we want to represent that geometry analytically, exactly, if possible. Okay? I will tell you uh, later on, uh, towards the end of my talk, you know, recently actually we are using a new mapping method, it's called transfinite. We, 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 we managed to significantly speed up the solver. Okay, all right, uh, so the second goal of this is that we want to deal with the um, resistive MHD. So one of the things that a lot of people deal with ideal MHD where you don't consider uh, diffusion. Okay? Resistive, resistive means that the magnetic resistivity you need to include. Okay? Um, there's a fundamental physics in plasma dynamics, it's called 
magnetic reconnection. If you don't consider resisti resistivity, you cannot create a magnetic reconnection. Okay? So you have to include the viscous effect. And to create that, to include those uh, viscous effect, and that will challenge your numerical algorithm. For instance, you deal with a large Reynolds number, and you need to have better numerical algorithm. Similarly, in MHD, right? So viscous flow is more challenging than, than in visit, for sure. And then also, based on those algorithms, we still want to keep our data structure so that we can do parallel computing as efficient as before. Okay, okay uh, so this is a very small team, and uh, I have Scott Chin, uh, who is going to uh, defend his thesis uh, next semester. And I recruited a girl, uh, so Joyce Stone just joined uh, six months ago. And Russell Henke uh, is an ungraded RA. Okay, so let me show you uh, the invisit. Invisit, we call it ideal MHD equations. So in 3D, we are going to solve eight equations. You have continuity equation, the first one. And then you have three momentum equation. And then you have three magnetic equation, B equation. And you have a total energy equation. Okay, so if you look at the total energy, now you have internal energy, right? You have kinetic energy. Then you have the third part, magnetic energy, right? So total energy has three parts. Okay, so the B equation, very often we call it induction equation. So this induction equation has, because B is a vector field. So we have three components. Uh, and then I, if I write that into a, a Instead of the divergent form, the first equation is divergent form. <coughs> the second equation, uh, we use uh, kind of the curl operator, and they are equivalent. Okay? So now, I will take a divergence of that equation. Okay, we know that a divergence, look at the equation for the right hand side. A divergence of the curl operator like that will give you zero. We know that mathematically. Okay, so then the left hand side gives you the time derivative of divergence B. So right hand side we know is zero. So the left hand side means that if your initial condition gives you divergence free B field, then throughout your simulation, the divergence B should be zero, mathematically, right? So you see that although we solved eight equations here, there is an implicit constraint it's called divergent free constraint that you have to set, satisfy. So whenever you build an algorithm, you need to ask yourself, will my algorithm satisfy the divergent free condition for magnetic, magnetic field? If not, then your, your method will blow up probably. So this is one difficulty uh, in MHD simulations. Okay, so I will move on to one attempt. This is over one semester, my graduate student and I thought, okay, uh, in the MHD field, this is constraint transport strategy is very widely adopted. So what it does is that, okay, so you will consider uh, a field, A field, which is called a vector potential. So vector potential is take a curl of that, you get B. So that is equation six. So okay, now we take the we plug the equation six into the original B equation, that induction equation, we get equation seven. Right? Simplify that, uh, we will get this vector potential equation. So this vector potential equation is equation equation number eight. If we solve equation number A, then our B field is automatically divergence free. Right? But uh, the problem is that uh, inside of the MHD equation, we don't have that vector potential equation. So meaning that it's not very compatible. So solving this set of equation, our B field probably over time will not be divergence free anymore. And then what we can do is that we solve one additional A equation. Make sure it's divergence free. 
and then use the solution from equation A to correct the B field that we obtained from MHD equations. So this is one way that we can do. Okay, so unfortunately, numerically, the A, you can compute A based on derivatives of B field, right? So meaning that in space, you need a stencil that is one order higher than the B field to get A. So meaning that you cannot use the same kind of grid topology anymore comparing to the original MHD equation. Okay, so this is one cumbersome, let's say, that we need to overcome. Okay, so we did a manager, a manager to publish one article. We stopped this part of research. Okay, so I mean, I can tell you briefly is that we want to control divergence B to be zero, but we control it too seriously in a way that our our entire algorithm becomes very cumbersome. It's not very friendly for parallel computing either. Okay? So mathematically it's good, right? So we are indeed controlling uh, the divergence uh, of B to machine precision. And we demonstrate that uh, through this publication. So now we want to define, we want to design a more uh, kind of like suitable uh, algorithm for parallel computing. And what we do is that we gener we, we use this uh, kind of uh, idea from this German research group. Uh, we call it uh, a generalized Lagrange multiplier, GLM approach, uh, where you see we incorporated one additional equation, psi equation, right? You see the psi, the last equation, we solve a scalar field, Psi. And then scalar field has two terms. In the middle, there is still a, a kind of convection term. You, but it's driven by a, a convective characteristic speed, CH. So that will kind of like convect the B field. And then the right-hand side, you have alpha Psi is a diffusive term. OK. Uh, so the whole idea is that on the right hand side, that vector, and there's a professor from University of Michigan, his name is uh, Powell. Powell really did some pioneering work in MHD. And, uh, and people named this vector following him, it's Powell vector. And uh, once we incorporate that additional equation of Psi, we still use Powell vector on the right, but we added one extra term, alpha Psi. And what I want to stress here is that you added one equation, Psi. But Psi, mathematically, will change the thermodynamics in your system. Psi will alter the entropy of the system. So now, you consider your total energy, internal energy, kinetic energy, magnetic energy. Now. Psi, this new vector that I introduced numerically, will contribute to the total energy as well. So initially, I hired a PhD student, a brilliant PhD student, in 2015. He joined my group in 2016. We did not realize this. We tried all the time for two semesters. We failed. And then this German group published this article, very mathematical. And they demonstrate that you need to alter your governing equation in such a way that it's thermodynamically consistent. And we immediately adopted their mathematical model, and this is what we result in. Okay? So now the mathematical model, if you look at that, if you look at the induction equation, there's a in the middle, in the big bracket, you see that you got a you got a CH psi inside your induction equation. Also, you got a CH psi times U in your momentum, in your, in your total energy equation, right? So your total energy equation is reflecting the contribution from this numerical scalar field that you introduced, which is artificial, but uh, it makes the system consistent in terms of physics. It's very important. And then so once we know this, and then we just use the, the, the algorithm that we were originally playing with, and uh, so we, we even included the viscous effect there on. 
Okay, so now let me uh, discuss a little bit about one of the ideas of spectral difference method. So suppose you have a curved physical element. What we do is that we will do a mapping, a high order mapping, or even an illegal mapping, to map that to a standard square, in 3D, a standard cube. We want that map to be as accurate as possible to reflect the curvature. And then m at e equation 19, m is simply a mapping function, okay? So xi, yi stands for the nodal point for the physical element. And then you will relate to any, any points inside that physical element. We call it x, y on the left, okay? Anywhere. Because your function, your mapping function, so Cosi and eta are coordinates of their square reference element. So now your mapping function will do the job analytically for you so that you can get to know anything inside that specific element with a higher order polynomial representation. Okay, so what we do here is that we are using a term called strong form. Any student know strong form and weak form? Okay, so we are using a strong form, meaning that we are dealing with that uh, original differential form, and we are not doing times uh, kind of weight function, and we are not doing volume integration or surface integral. Okay, so uh, in that way, we can save a lot of computational cost. So what you see is that suppose you have a physical flux, and in two D you have two components you call F and G. And now I'm going to use that mapping matrix I call it Jacobian here, J. I use, if you look at the equation 21, I have the determinant of J. I have the inverse of J. And now I have a physics, a physical flux, F and G. I transform them to the computational space. So I have F cubed, G cubed. So F cubed and G cubed, F tilde is along Cauchy direction. G tilde is along either direction. Okay, so now, after doing that, okay, I can insert additional degrees of freedom inside that reference element. So the circular points is the solution point that I always stop values for Q tilde. And then Q tilde is basically rho, rho u, e, those kind of conservative variables for you. And then you see those uh, triangles will store F tilde, G tilde, respectively, uh, for the fluxes. Okay, so the benefit here is that obviously we can construct the polynomial to, 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 to have smooth functions within each element. Um, so we, we also uh, need to make sure that the choices of those flux points and solution points will give us a stable method, okay? So I will, I will go escape that part. So the point here is that we end up with this. We end up with a transformed kind of equation for Nevis-Stokes or MHD. Um, if you look at equation 33, I want you to look at, in the bracket, I want you to look at a partial F to the partial C, and a partial G to the partial E. Then. So F to is along C direction those triangular points, a single line. And G tilde is along either direction, vertically. It's also along one single line. So it means that we will do a one-dimensional polynomial calculation, which is analytical, but it's 1D. So we can compute the right-hand side terms of Navistokes or MHD, like using largely one-dimensional operations. So the efficiency is pretty good because you do it like using 1D operations. And you plug them together, you get the residual, and then you do a time margin on the left-hand side, you update the solution. So the method is extremely simple. Okay, so now for viscous flow, very often we will have shock, for instance, right? So uh, how to how to preserve that high order thing while 
you still can capture the shock. So we are using one idea, it's called artificial dissipation. I would say that you know, uh, if, if students want to uh, know the details of this artificial dissipation, and reference 11 is a, in GFM is a great reference. And I did my postdoc uh, with Tony Jameson in Stanford. And uh, after I left, uh, Guido Lodato uh, joined the same group. So, so he's the, the postdoc after me. And uh, he now is a professor in, Fran in France. So that's his recent work are really great, mostly on large AV simulation. OK, so I'm now going to demonstrate the unstructured mesh. I will solve MHD. I'm going to tell you whether our solution is high order or not. So there is a benchmark problem. It's called often wave, often wave uh, adv advection problem. And this is a kind of a, a rectangular box. We will use uh, periodic boundary conditions. And, and you can see that the, 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 the grid on the left is very coarse. And then we will do a nested refine, refinement. Right? Like one cell, we will split that into four cells, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So on the right is after three level refinement. You get a much finer grid. And then with that, we can check the numerical accuracy. Okay, so for instance, we use a third order method. And uh, if you look at uh, the, the B field, you clearly see the order actually is slightly <coughs> higher than three. So 3.5 3.7, 3.3. And now if you look at the fourth order, also look at the B field, and uh, you can clearly see the order is very close to four, like 4.7, 3.98, 3 3.99. So it's pretty good, right? And if you check the divergence B, and the order will drop by one, right? Because divergence B, uh, you need to take the gradients of in each direction, add them together. All right, and then and then the good thing is that with this test problem, and then we can crank up the polynomial degree. For instance, we can check seventh order, eighth order. I will tell you why we, we want to really increase the degree of the polynomial later on. Okay? So the method is indeed arbitrary high order. If you deal with ideal MHD without shock, okay? if there is no shock and you have an analytical solution, you can verify. So this spectral difference with divergence cleaning is high order. OK, now we simulate this kind of like a very well-known benchmark problem. It's called outside the town vertex problem. So initially, the flow is quite smooth. And then later on, it generates a lot of shocks. So this problem um, is challenging over time. And as you run, and then the shock will interact, those structures will interact. And the fine structure will be quite challenging to resolve, um, especially if your grid is pretty coarse. So what we do is that we use a 400 by 400 grid. And then we simulate what you see that uh, we simulate from 0.1 second to 0.6 second at the right bottom, 0.6 second. And the results are very consistent with the results published in the literature. And at a certain specific time, let's say 0.5 second, and we use a very coarse, and previous grid was like 400 by 400. Here we only use 100 by 100, right? So that's 16 times coarser. Now what we do is that how about we use higher order? Let's say fifth order, sixth order. Are we going to have the same solution? Indeed, indeed. So we can use cost grid, and we can increase the degree of polynomial, we still get pretty good solution even with shocks. All right, so on a 200 by 200 grid, and we intentionally curve the boundary. You see that uh, you know, on the top and bottom, we use a wavy boundary, physical boundary, and you can clearly see that our method is valid on complex geometries. Right? It still creates clean physics. That's the, that's the advantage of using, using unstructured mesh. OK, here we deal with another challenging problem called a magnetic rotor problem. And I will, I will now go into detail. So I will now demonstrate the magnetic flow past a cylinder. And you can clearly see uh, on the top, 
uh, you, 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 you see a velocity U field. At the bottom, that is an X component of a B field, BX. Right? And uh, so, unstructured mesh, uh, flow past a cylinder, and the resolution is extremely clean. All right, uh, so now I'm going to talk about one case that is related to space weather. And there is a very famous uh, phenomenon called magnetic reconnection. Uh, so what we do is that we start from kind of like, there's a term called current sheet, right? It's like if you have a, a magnetic field that goes to the right, and then magnetic field that goes to the left, and then in between, there, there will, you will have a very thin layer. If that is very thin, it will trigger a new deformation to a new topology of the magnetic, magnetic field. So the thinner, the more dangerous, right? Very likely the magnetic energy will be released into some other forms, right? Could be kinetic energy, could be yeah, temperature, right? So, so what we see that, uh, let me play a movie. Um, so initially we just start from a current sheet, okay? And uh, at a relatively high resistivity eta, is the magnetic resistivity. And you see that it created the two magnetic islands, right, on the two sides. Now, if I drop the resistivity, I create a third island, magnetic island, in the middle. Look at that. And as time goes, that magnetic island got sucked in by the third island. So it merged with the third one. And we say, okay, this could be artificial numerically. And uh, so we did check against uh, some prediction from Germany. There is a group. They got the same kind of dynamics as what we got. Okay. So this is non physical. So the central island got merged with the right island. <laughs> numerically, <coughs> other solvers also predicted, but it's non physical. What is the reason? The reason is that the standard MHD model is no longer sufficient. We need to consider Hall effect. There is a term in magnetic field. Uh, in, in MHD, there is a, a term called Hall effect. So recently, we are looking into Hall MHD. So we need to change the mathematical model and uh, just add some Hall effect, change some terms, and it creates significant change on your Mark method. So I think this is a new direction, and uh, I think it will take at least one more PhD students uh, to really make a, a, a reliable method for simulating how MHD. Okay, so what I show today is uh, purely uh, the standard MHD, but for magnetic reconnection, I think we need how MHD. Okay. All right, so uh, so let me do a short summary. Uh, I think we created a, a one called a S SDDC spectral difference with divergence cleaning method. That is arbitrarily high order for ideal MHD on unstructured meshes. And we added artificial dissipation, and we really verified that the method with artificial dissipation is robust for resistive MHD, even with shocks. And upon it, what is essential is that our algorithm is extremely friendly for parallel computing. It's as friendly as the original Navier Stokes solver. Okay, so this one is this is a recent article published this year in Astrophysical Journal. I think this is a very good starting point for us and for dealing with MHD and also astrophysics. Okay, so future work. This is what I want to tell you uh, something exciting. Okay, and uh, this work is uh, almost done, and uh, we, we are preparing a journal article to the Astrophysical Journal again. And so, what we did is two things. So for the original colors, you saw we captured the differential rotation of the sun. And uh, we did not like the speed of that solver. We want to accelerate. So what we did is that we did not, we abandoned the isoparametric mapping. We moved to this transfinite mapping. Transfinite is more analytical. Okay? I will not go into details. I have slides in my laptop uh, for details. And, uh, so you, you will lose some geometrical accuracy in isoparameric mapping. But now with transfinite, everything is represented exactly. So the curvatures of those two spherical surfaces, spherical shell surfaces, 
or captured exactly. Secondly, we typically do third order, fourth order simulations originally. Now we do sixth order, seventh order simulations. So we use very coarse grid, but use very high degrees of polynomial because the flow in the sun is like very smooth. There's no shock. So no problem. And it saves us a lot of computational time. Our solver is about 200 times faster than our original by, use, by doing this tool. So the geometric effect is significant for the sun. If you lose any geometric accuracy, it will result in a big error in the fluid solution. Okay. All right, uh, so here I'm going to demonstrate you know, how did we do this analytically. So we, we use a cube, cube sphere grid, and so this part is done analytically, and the grid is very coarse, six by 20, uh, so basically six pieces, and put six pieces together, and then each piece is by 20 by eight by eight, okay? Very coarse. And then this is a procedure of constructing this uh, transparent mapping, okay? And if you want, if you are curious, and what I can tell you is that isoparametric mapping in this formula is just a part. So like 42, 42 is one, so let, let, let me move this. So 43, 43 is kind of like isoparametric mapping. You see that in the, in the uh, transfinite, the last term is isoparametric, 38. So the last term is kind of like due to iso, isoparametric mapping. So what you do is that, okay, so think about a, a curve, like a, one, one of the edge over that uh, uh, hollow uh, part, and you, you, you can use an analytical function to re represent that, and map, it, map that to a straight, straight line, and that is, that essentially is one of the uh, uh, p, psi, p eta, or p zeta, right? So then you have a second order term, and that will reflect it through the 42, and then you have a third order term uh, that is reflected in 40, 43 over here. Okay, so after combining them together, uh, you get uh, the complete uh, kind of uh, transfinite uh, representation. Um, so the idea come really come from the material science field. It's, uh, the transfinite uh, is from 1960s in the material science field that did this pretty rigorously. Okay, so quickly, very quickly, I just say that we did a third order simulation on the top, we did the sixth order simulation at the bottom, okay? And then uh, we also compared the, the, the efficiency against the previous uh, version of the code, also against the efficiency uh, of a code from NCAR. Um, so we are extremely excited about this new development, and this will appear in a new publication pretty soon, okay? So next step, we want to simulate a 3D magnetic reconnection, and we want to simulate a 3D solar dynamo. So I will end from here. I can take any questions. Yeah, thanks. Um, any questions for the audience? Yeah, Jim. When you're working with the sliding mesh, can you explain a little bit more about uh, I guess how that uh, works at the interface? Sure, system? absolutely, absolutely. Let me. Uh, I, I did a yeah, I did a two D animation, and I will I will tell you the idea. The idea is very simple. Um, so you see that the interface is very important, obviously. So now the the sliding interface is in green. Okay. Uh, what is challenging is that, um, so suppose suppose you are gonna have let's say you look at look at that uh, outer outer uh, partition we call it fixed part, and then this is a sp spinning part, right? So now typically what you do is that you want to communicate, you want to communicate <laughs> this physical edge, physical edge with some physical edge here from the interior, right? So it's quite hard to have exact mapping. So meaning that uh, the grid definitely is non-conforming, right? And so what we do is that we introduce this mortar structure. Mortar is more like a bricks, right? So like those structures, it's kind of artificial. Okay, we created those mortar interface, 
in a way that we will do, like here, if you look at, uh, I'll give you one example. Here, one physical face, right? It will, you will correspond to two models, right? You, a larger piece, a small piece. Uh, this two, right? Uh, so that, that two model will correspond to that uh, inner physical edge very nicely. Okay, now if you look at one outer physical edge, this one, it will correspond to this large model and this large model. So the model can, can correspond to and communicate with a physical edge inside, outside, exactly, right? So what you do is that now we're gonna project our solution through least squares. We are not going to do any interpolation. So we are not going to interpolate our solution onto the model. We will use a list of squares because we have polynomial over there available. So we project onto the model and we will project first from the physical domain onto the model and then construct the Riemann solver, construct the common viscous flux. After that, we will project back. So this is two-way travel, right? So you first, from your physical flow field onto the model, after you construct the numerical flux, you project those numerical flux back to your physical faces. So this, uh, this is done in 1D, it's pretty easy. Now in 3D, uh, it's not that easy, uh, because in 3D, the slide interface is two-dimensional. Okay? Let me show you. So think about it. And the reason which I, wish you, I show you this spinning disk is that uh, if you want to consider a spinning dome, you need at least a three sliding interfaces. So one is kind of like a, a cylindrical, the other two are planar. Right? Uh, so what we do here is that um, we will need to do, to do a two-dimensional list of squares. Right? The previous one is rather easy. So to do a two-dimensional list of squares, uh, I think what we find is the easiest is that uh, to do, uh, I, I have some, on my, on my laptop I have some uh, figures to illustrate the idea. So suppose you want to do it, uh, if I can draw it somewhere, you can draw it marker. Yeah. So to do a two dimensional projection, let's say, um, so what, what you can do that, let's say you could, uh, suppose this is, a, this is a physical face, right? So now you can suppose you 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 split you split this physical phase uh, to correspond to four models, and what you can do that you first do a one dimensional projection about this, okay, and then you do. Basically, you, what you, you do, you create two panels. Okay, okay so you project from there to there, this is a 1D projection, right? And then you project from this to there, it's another 1D projection. You combine these two steps together, that will give you a 2D This is squares projection, right? So it's a little, a little complicated, but you can make sure that your procedure is fully conservative later on. Okay. Because the least square is very nice in terms of maintaining the conservation property. Okay. Any other questions? I have maybe one. Okay. I guess um, on the Sun um, MHD modeling, if, if I'm wrong, you're, you're using a, essentially a curvilinear coordinate basis. So does that restrict you to basically X cells? Hex dominated, or do you have good to have point. strict hex cells? Good, 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 point, good point. Good point. Good point. Good prisms. Um, yeah, I I should say that. Uh, I mean, in the in the aircraft design world, a lot of people like uh, simplex elements to mesh. You know, like Tony Jameson himself, for instance, he does. He uses a lot of simplex elements for grid generation. And now I joined his group. And uh, in those days, we find that a spectral difference is extremely friendly for quadrilateral uh, hats. For because we like to use that tensor yeah. product. Like, no, that's, that's good. I, mean, yeah. I, I get that. We mm -hmm. use hexes. So yeah. The, 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 uh, Jack, the only problem that I think the map generating is troublesome. Yeah. If, we can, yeah, if we can generate a good grid uh, 
We actually prefer hex anyway. So basically, the accuracy is great. It's great. The, yeah. the speed is very good, but then you have to spend spend time you, you generating the time on generating. The yeah, cash. that's the thing. We would do every day. All right. Yeah. Any other things? Otherwise, we'll conclude, and we got to move on with this business. So, sure. appreciate you all. Nice You're meeting welcome. you, everybody. Yeah.
computer science and CFD. Yeah, yeah because I saw it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure I got tons of questions for you to talk about. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll catch up later. I don't want to sort of drag you on this. Um, I think I think he sent me. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Of switch or only for authorized So you know what? Let me go talk to him. You wanna just come with me okay. and I can probably get you to use the uh, this is your this is your blazer? Here. Yeah. I can I can carry that. Thanks. Wow, so where are we? Like what? Two generations apart. <laughs> <laughs> 